Hey everybody, my name is Michael Andrew, and today I want to give you a free tutorial on the Nikon D3500. Wonderful little camera. I love its cost, obviously, the size and the weight, and it has an excellent 24 megapixel sensor in it. Many of you are pure beginners to photography, so I want to emphasize that knowing how to operate the camera isn't going to be enough to go out and take great images. If this is you, I would definitely recommend checking out my brand new course, Universal Photography Concepts. I'll put that link in the description. It'll teach you how to think in terms of the physics of photography. Very proud of it. I'm also giving away a free camera, a Sony a7 III. It's a $2,000 camera. Amazing. It's one of my favorite cameras right now. I'll put that link in the description as well. Very easy and free to enter to win. So many of you are probably wondering, how do you find all the different chapters for this tutorial? We've made a table of contents, and if you use the search feature of your browser, type it in, it'll highlight it, and you can click to that link, and it'll take you right there. So in any event, we have a ton of information to cover. Let's get started. Before I take you on a full overview of all the buttons and controls, I wanted to point out a few quick notes that you'll notice that on your lens, you're going to have a, a little white dot on the lenses. It's right there. And there's also a white dot on your camera body. These two are meant to line up and then rotate the lens on. One important tip that I can give you is that you turn the camera body upside down. So this should be facing the ground when you change your lenses. If it's not, you're increasing the chances of, of something falling into your camera body and creating sensor dust. And you'll notice this as a as like a gray speck on, on all of your images. It's going to be in the exact same place if this has happened, and you can reduce that again by changing your lenses upside down. Try not to change them in, in windy conditions, things of that nature. When you turn your camera on, so here's the power switch, and you're getting ready to shoot, especially if you have a kit lens, it's going to ask you to unlock the lens. So this was not available on earlier models of the lens. It has a little L indicator, and there's a lock button right here that you're going to push and rotate to open the lens to. 18 to 55 millimeters. Let's talk about some of the buttons and controls real quick. Again, here's your power button, pretty important. We have an autofocus lamp here. Sometimes this will turn on automatically depending on what mode you're in, and um, I'll make some recommendations on that. The shutter button obviously is right here. Very important to note that this is a two phase button. There's a halfway position, and then there's a full position that takes the picture. So when you push this halfway down, you can kind of hear it a little bit. That engages the camera's focusing systems. So it's going to focus on your subject, push it down all the way to take the picture. We'll be talking more about this when we discuss the optical focusing systems, which is through the viewfinder. This button here, the mode dial, very important. It's going to tell the camera what conditions to change the exposure settings. Manual mode is Obviously, you're going to do everything. And then we have a PS and A modes. I'll be making recommendations on those. This button right here is the plus minus sign. We have a picture of some aperture blades. Very important when you're shooting in aperture priority mode if you want to change your brightness. It's called the exposure compensation button. Fancy way of saying changing image brightness. And then we have our command wheel right here. You're going to be using your shutter button, the mode dial button the command wheel, and your exposure compensation button quite a bit. This is the live view lever. This is going to kick the camera into live view, which is going to shift what you're seeing on the back display. It's like a little TV monitor. And I'll demonstrate all that, of course. Shifting it back will go to your information screen. Lens release button right here. Hot shoe mount. Right here is the pop-up flash. It's a little tiny flash that will pop up and give you some fill light. One button I comically left out was the video record button. It has a little red dot on it. It's right next to the shutter button. When you push that, that's going to start or stop video recording. On the back of the camera, we have our flash engage button. This is going to pop up the flash in certain modes. Here, it's popping up. Next, just above it, you're going to see the flash exposure compensation. And what this means is that when the flash is up, if you push and hold that down, it's going to allow you to adjust the flash power. This little dial right here, just to the right of the viewfinder, 
that's your diopter adjustment. What that means is if you use corrective eyewear, glasses, contacts, this is going to help you adjust the focus through the viewfinder. We have our information button, auto focus lock, auto exposure lock button. There's a way to customize this, which I'll demonstrate in the focusing lesson. We have our playback button, deep menu button. We have our eye button, which is different than the info button. I'll demonstrate that. We have our directional pad, the OK, which is like a set or return button on a computer. Just to the bottom in the right of it, we have our drive modes button. This is going to tell the camera what to do after we push the shutter button down all the way. We have our delete button, garbage can icon. We have our zoom in, zoom out for playback. This question mark sometimes will give us menu information, a little definition of what it is we're doing or changing on the camera. And then we have our back LCD monitor. Very important, very critical. You're going to be changing a lot of information. You're going to be viewing images and things of that nature on the back monitor. Obviously, we have on the right side our card slot for a single SD card slot. And then we have an HDMI out and USB terminal on the left side of the camera. Let's talk about the information that you're going to see on your back monitor. Very important to make some distinctions here. The info button is going to allow you to toggle this screen on or off. So if you're in a certain situation, you want to turn that off, boom. So if it disappears, try that. And there's also a distinction between the info button and the eye button. And I'll point that out in a second. In the top left-hand corner, you're going to have your shooting mode. This little N icon basically means the camera is going to try to clean up vignetting in the corners. It's a darkening in the corners that you're going to see in wide-angle lenses. Image stabilization. This S refers to single shot. That's where a drive mode indicator will appear. Beep indicator. Battery indicator. These three big circles are very important. We have our shutter speed, aperture, and ISO. And something that's cool about the aperture is it shows the aperture blades. And so it's, it's sort of like a little preview of what's happening to your aperture blades as you rotate your command dial, changing them. We'll talk about all that in just a second. But shutter speed, aperture, ISO, you're gonna be looking here more than anywhere else. Focusing mode, then we have our number of shots remaining. You're gonna see this bracket in a little K here. K means thousand. I have 7,000 images available on the memory card. This is going to change depending on the format you're shooting in, whether it's RAW or JPEG, the size of the files, things of that nature. Now below all this, we have these 12 different options down here. And you're going to notice that you can't really highlight them, right? But if you push the I button, it's going to allow us to access and change all of these very handy. Okay, so just get used toggling that on and off. We'll go through each of these real quick. Image quality refers to raw and JPEG. See, look at the predicted number changing raw only, fine is the highest quality JPEG. Compression for normal essentially means the camera is going to tell adjacent pixels that are similar enough that they're now the same. It's very difficult to see the difference between fine and, and normal to the naked eye. But if you look at the number of shots remaining in, in the file size, it can save twice the space. Okay, so normal is about half the size of fine. Basic is about half the size of, of normal. You're probably gonna start seeing some de degradation at basic, but you know if you're shooting for the web or you don't need really high quality images and you're running out of space, I typically shoot on fine or raw, depending on what I'm doing. If it's important, I'm shooting raw or raw in JPEG. If it's more casual, you know, kids playing around, things of that nature, I'll probably be shooting on JPEG. Press the I button to go out. Image size is the number of megapixels. When you come in here, you can shoot full size, which is 24 megapixels. Megabytes is an estimation of how big the file is in terms of, of memory. And then we have smaller uh, images with medium and small. Typically, I'm almost always shooting on large because you can take a large image and downsize. You can't really take a small image and upsize without losing quality. White balance, we're talking about this in depth. This is where we select the color temperature that we're shooting in. Active D lighting, think of this as an automatic contrast control. 
And for JPEGs, I leave it on on most of the time. You can turn it off. You're going to notice a slight shift in some of the dynamic range. This is more of, of a processing thing that happens as the camera is recording to the memory card. Some people love it. Some people hate it. If I'm shooting JPEGs, yeah, it's typically enough. Flash control, the flash mode that we're shooting in. We'll briefly talk about all these. ISO control, if you haven't heard, I don't know, this is the sensitivity of the sensor. Lower numbers mean that the camera is going to capture images cleanly with less noise. There's going to be better image quality. If we're in a low light shooting situation and we have really slow shutter speeds, we can come in here and turn this up. The problem with this is, is that as we make the sensor more and more sensitive to light, we increase the amount of grain. It's an artifact that you're going to see in very high ISO images. And 12,800, you're probably gonna see it pretty easily. For sure, 25,600, you'll see it in uh, flesh tones. It kind of smooths out. The camera tries to reduce some of the, the grain sometimes. And so just keep that in mind. Yeah, you can shoot in low light conditions, but once you get into these higher numbers, it's usually not that great. The focusing modes have to do when the camera is focusing. The focusing area has to do with the where the camera is focusing and the clusters. You can come in here and change the clusters. We'll talk about that in depth as well. Metering mode is how the camera is measuring light that's entering through the lens. Picture control, I like to think of these guys as recipes for JPEGs. It's basically how the image is being baked or processed by the camera. Cameras are going to capture initially raw data and convert it into a JPEG, throwing away a lot of information, just keeping the most important parts of the image. If you're shooting raw, you're capturing the complete raw original file. So picture controls apply to JPEGs only. Flash exposure compensation, fancy way of saying flash brightness control. And then we have normal exposure compensation. So that's an overview of the back monitor as well as the eye button. Let's talk about the mode dial located on the top of the camera. There's so many icons and letters and numbers on top of this. What I want you to notice is that as you rotate this mode dial, you're going to notice the letter changing in the top left hand corner. The most important modes that you need to be focusing on are P, program mode, S, shutter priority mode, A, which is aperture priority mode, and M, which is the manual mode. And if you're my best friend and you came over here and you're like, Michael, what am I doing? I would put a lot of pressure on you to try to learn aperture priority mode first. Between aperture priority mode and manual mode, this covers probably 95% of the modes that I'm shooting in. And instead of spending all this extra time on, on modes that you may or may not use, focus on aperture priority when you start getting a good feel for the camera. Worst case scenario, focus on program mode. Program is like an automatic mode. What I definitely do not recommend is shooting on this mode here, auto mode. This is really bad. Auto mode is gonna do everything for you. It puts everything into automatic. You can't change your ISO, you can't change your focusing. You know, it's just basically the camera is gonna be running the show. The reason why you bought this camera is for the sensor size and, and the controls of the exposure and the focusing. And so worst case, program mode. Program mode has its time in place for beginners. I've heard of some pros that shoot in program mode when they're using flash, just depends on what they're doing. Now there's some other modes on the dial that you're going to notice. One of them is effects. Effects is kind of fun. It's sort of gimmicky, you know, but I don't really use it. If you wanted to change which effect you're using, rotate the command dial and you'll see you get this little photo illustration, toy camera, miniature effect. Probably easier to see this in live view. So I'm gonna to toggle the live view lever. And this is going to give you a preview of the effect that you're doing. Put my hand out here, let's see if we can see some of these guys. Photo illustration, right? It's almost like a comic book sort of thing. Toy camera. 
Not a huge fan of them. Why? Because you can do all these things in post if you really wanted to go that route. As you continue to rotate the mode dial, we come into these preset automatic modes. You're going to notice a little picture icon and some of the information is going to change as well. So low light, you're going to notice this little icon of an individual with a little star or light behind them. And you're going to notice that the flash mode changed to slow sync. This is going to allow for a slow shutter speed with the fill flash, macro mode or close up mode. Then we have sports mode, person running, no flash. Then we have portrait mode, it's a woman with a hat. And we have our no flash mode. If you're at Elvis's house, let's say, and they say no flash. Again, all of these modes, these automatic preset modes, I don't recommend messing around with them. You would still benefit from getting images with the full size sensor, but the camera is going to be making most of the decisions. So we're going to be focusing on aperture priority mode. So something I want you to become very comfortable with is toggling into live view mode. So this is what we see through the viewfinder. Toggle that lever, lever again and we come back to our information screen. Let's go through some of this information real quick. So we have our shooting mode, our flash mode, our drive mode now set to single frame, our focusing mode, auto focus single, our focusing cluster, active D lighting, we have our picture control, our white balance setting, we have right here our image size, compression type, image stabilization in the lens, battery indicator, beep, metering, shutter speed, aperture, ISO. Those three are very important. You're also going to see them in the viewfinder where you see a fraction refers to shutter speed, F refers to the opening of the lens, the aperture, and then ISO. You notice this ISO A is flashing. So definitely hope you have your camera in hands. We're gonna start talking about exposure control. And something I want you to do, very critical, is we're gonna turn off automatic ISO. Automatic ISO means that the camera is going to be making changes to the sensor sensitivity without your permission. And I believe that Nikon set this up default to help people get started and make it easier to take pictures. The problem with it is, is that if you're in a low light shooting situation, it's gonna boost your ISO, okay? And some of the images can look really terrible and there's ways around that, you know, using a tripod at longer shutter speeds. So we're gonna turn this off for the sake of exposure discussion. So we're going to come into the deep menu, green tab, ISO sensitivity settings. And to navigate in the menu, you are where the yellow highlight is. And I'm using my directional pad up and down. You'll notice that there's five tabs. And those tabs all have their own color. There's a little color frame around each of those tabs. Blue is for playback, green is for shooting, orange is your setup. We have a retouch menu, which is purple. And then we have our custom menu or my menu. We'll be going through most of these here. And the one I want you to look at is green tab. And so we're going to push right to highlight, so remember, you are where the yellow is. Something that's very subtle on the far right is that we have this slider bar. So what that means is there are different pages within each tab. So even though you have one tab, you may have three or four pages. I know there's three pages here from the size of the bar. So as I continue to scroll down, so it moves to the middle, continue to scroll down to the bottom, if I keep on going, it resets, so it stays within that tab. You have to move over to go to the next tab and then down. It's going to be four pages there. So that's how you navigate through the deep menu. So we're going to come back to ISO sensitivity settings. And the auto ISO sensitivity control is what we're going to turn off. The only time I turn that on is when I am shooting low light sports and I have to have a certain shutter speed and a certain aperture. I'll turn auto ISO on because if there's changes in lighting, I don't want to have to make adjustments to the camera. It's the only time I use it. And other pros will tell you otherwise. This is one man's opinion. So now that this is turned off, let's talk about exposure control. So the aperture priority mode is the one I want to focus on because you're going to get the most out of this. Aperture priority mode means that when we change our aperture, 
the camera is going to make adjustments automatically to the shutter speed. See that? So the aperture is changing and the shutter speed is also changing, but this is something that the camera is controlling. In shutter priority mode, we designate the shutter speed in the camera changes the aperture. Talk about this in a second. In program mode, you're going to notice that the camera changes both. And then in manual mode, we change shutter speed. Look how the aperture stays the same. There's a way that we dial in the aperture as well. So something I want to point out is that it's very important to sneak a peek at the shutter speed when you're using aperture priority mode. Because you, if you're shooting people, you want to have a shutter speed of at least 1 60th of a second. That's the short answer. Okay, people move too. If you're trying to shoot people at 1 30th of a second, you can probably expect a lot of your images to be blurry. So right now, I cannot open my aperture wider. It's not letting me open it. Shutter speed's 1 30th of a second. If I, take, if I were to take a picture of my blinds, I'm on a tripod. It's kind of dark. So we have a number of problems here. If you get into a situation like this, where your shutter speeds are low, you can't open your, your aperture blades more, look at your ISO. Very low ISO, and we have some room to play with, right? 100 is the lowest setting. So what I'm going to do is come in, let's try 400. Look what happened to the shutter speed, bumped up. So now we could shoot at 1 100th of a second, ISO 400. And if we were shooting portraits, that would, that would be, in most cases, fast enough, depending on what kind of lens you have. There's something called the reciprocal rule, where you want to use a shutter speed that is the reciprocal of your focal length. So if you're shooting at 200 millimeters, ideally this would be 1 200th of a second. If you had a 100 millimeter lens, 1 100th of a second. If you had a, a 60 or a 70 millimeter lens, you'd want to be 60 or 70 or 80, but you can't dial in those shutter speeds. You use 60 or 80. That's just a rule of thumb. My experience has been is if you're steady, you can get away with quite a bit sometimes, but if you're a beginner, keep that in mind. So I want to show you something that's pretty cool here. Take your hand and point your camera at something and something bright. And I want you to move your hand in front of the camera and watch what happens. The shutter speed is changing. So the camera is making changes to the shutter speed depending on how much light is entering the lens. That's very important. Okay, so it's going to do a lot of work for you. Professionally, when I shot weddings, I would shoot aperture priority mode. Why? Because we'd be in a dark church. And as the bride and groom are leaving, now we're in a kind of a medium lit lobby. And in two seconds, we're outside. And so we might have three different lighting conditions change in a matter of seconds. And I don't want to be fumbling with my exposure settings. Same thing with sports shooting. I'm on aperture priority mode. Why? Because sometimes clouds come over the sun and during the action, I don't want to fumble with my settings and fumble back. And so what I try to do is dial in my aperture and keep an eye on my shutter speed, what my shutter speed's doing. Something that you'll need to do and get in the habit of is taking a picture and inspecting it. It's a good habit to start to make sure you're getting your focus, your exposure, everything's right. So let's talk about changing your image brightness. You'll notice that as we change our aperture, the exposure stays the same. Why? Because the camera is doing exactly what we're asking it to do. It's changing and making adjustments to the shutter speed in order to compensate for aperture changes. So the question you probably have is, Michael, how do we make images brighter? I can even see here, this is a little too dark for my taste. This is where exposure compensation comes in. It's that button on the top of the camera with a diagonal plus minus sign, aperture blades. What we're going to do is push and hold that button down and we get this yellow box on the bottom of our camera, 0.0. .0. We start rotating this. See it getting brighter, 0 0.3, 0 0.7, 1. See how much brighter that is? Let's keep going. Let's go to 2. I'm going to take a picture. It's probably a little bit too bright. But look at the difference in brightness between this image and the, the image I took beforehand. I think so I'm trying to scroll. 
Look at the difference between those two. See how much brighter that is? Let's say it's way too bright and we want to go and make it darker. We'd go in the opposite direction. So you'll notice that little square, the top left one is positive and the bottom right one is negative. So when you see that, that means we're getting darker, darker, darker. You can see the shutter speed is changing to be faster. Let me take a picture. So you're going to get a tremendous amount of mileage out of using exposure compensation in the aperture priority mode. It's gonna give you a lot of firepower. Again, just keep on checking your shutter speed. Try to keep it, you know, 1 60th, 1 100th. If you're shooting people, if it's sports, 1 500th, maybe 1 1,000th. Something I want to point out for the sake of discussion, I kind of love these little philosophy sidetracks, is I want to demonstrate something very interesting. So we're at an even exposure, 1 100th of a second. What do you think these numbers refer to? Let's go to one stop. One stop refers to twice the amount of light. Look at the shutter speed. 1 50th of a second. Let's go back to an even exposure. So 1 100th of a second is twice as fast as 1 50th of a second. Okay? So we're using a longer shutter speed, much longer shutter speed. Why? Because if we were to take 1 100th of a second and add it to 1 100th of a second, that would be 2 100ths of a second. An easier way of saying that is 1 50th of a second. If you're good with fractions, that's what's happening. We are letting in twice the amount of light, which is one stop. And so what that's what all this means is stops of light is how many times more light we're letting in. So quiz time, I'm going to ask you if we continue going up to two stops, what do you think the shutter speed will be? What is twice as long? as 1 50th. So if we were to go 1 50th plus 1 50th, we would get 1 25th of a second, two stops. Let's take it a step further. What about three stops? Well, you can half that fraction, right? 12.5, and it rounds to 13 or 15. Let's go in the opposite direction just to demonstrate this. So what would be twice as fast as 1 100th of a second. This is a little easier. 1 200th of a second. What's twice as fast as 1 200th of a second? 1 400th of a second. What's twice as fast as 1 400th? 1 800th of a second, three stops. And so that's how exposure compensation works. And even once you dial it in, again, if you take your hand, let's get a, I usually shoot at like a third or maybe two thirds stops. If you take your hand and you move it in front of the camera, the camera's still adjusting the shutter speed according to our camera settings. So that is how aperture priority mode works. It's how we change our aperture and our shutter speed in that mode, the brightness. Let's talk about shutter priority mode. It's a little different now, and you're going to notice that the aperture is flashing. When you see the aperture flashing, the camera is not happy. You'll notice that the question mark icon is flashing. That means that if you push this button right here, it's going to give you some additional information saying the subject's too dark, we can't adjust exposure, choose a slower shutter speed. So Nikon's trying to help us understand what's going on with our camera, right? Long story short, if you see your aperture flashing, what it means is you can't open your aperture wide enough, or the camera can't, to let enough light in to make this shutter speed work. So we're dialing in the shutter speed. We have to use a slower shutter speed, longer shutter speed, and we get to a point that it stops flashing and the camera's happy again. So watch what happens. I take my hand, put it in front of the camera. Watch what happens to the aperture. The aperture starts changing, right? So this is where the problem happens. You're indoors shooting your kid's soccer game. The lighting's bad and you need 1 500th of a second because of motion blur. If you use slow shutter speeds with motion, you're gonna get a lot of blur. We need 1 500th of a second 
Aperture's not happy. How are we going to get around this? Think about it for a second. How can we make this work? If you said adjust your ISO, you're absolutely correct. Press the I button, come into ISO. We're going to turn it up to 3200, which is pretty good. It's, it's, it's decent. You're not going to start seeing terrible stuff until you get a little bit higher. 3200, tap the shutter button, and the blinking has stopped. So what we've done is we've increased the sensitivity of the sensor to become more sensitive to light, which means we're going to get a good exposure at 1 500th of a second. I think most problems that beginning photographers run into is, is like indoor sports shooting. If you're outdoors and you got plenty of lights, a lot easier. Let's talk about the program mode. Program mode is great when you're first getting started. It's going to allow you to change things such as your ISO, your white balance, your focusing modes. It's going, going to give you some control. It's like taking the training wheels off a little bit. When you rotate your command wheel, you're going to notice that both the shutter speed and aperture are changing. In the camera, because we're in 3200, is essentially trying to maintain this even exposure. Okay, we can still control our exposure compensation. It works the same way. The camera just makes the adjustments to both, right? And it's nice when you're first getting started, but I don't really use it, okay? So something to keep in mind, both are changing. At some point, you're not going to be able to go further. Notice that? Kind of stopped. So that is your program mode. Let's talk about manual mode. The rule of thumb for me on manual mode is if I have enough time. If I'm in a rush, usually shooting on aperture priority mode, but if I have enough time and I really want to dial it in, if I am doing studio strobe work, I'm on manual mode, almost always. When I am shooting video, I am on manual mode. I don't want any camera changes when I'm shooting video. I don't want any exposure changes when I'm when I'm shooting video. So manual mode essentially means that we dial in the shutter speed and the aperture. The default is that when we rotate the command wheel, we're changing our shutter speed. We also get this bracket popping up, right? If we wanted to change the aperture, we're going to push the exposure compensation button, which has a picture of the aperture blades next to it. That's what it means is this is how you change your aperture. There it is. So this is going to take some muscle memory to bounce back and forth between shutter speed control and aperture control. Something very curious that you probably noticed was this little bracket popping up in the bottom right hand corner. That little bracket traditionally is the exposure compensation bar, but I want you to think of it as how bright or how dark the image is going to be. And so in manual mode, this is giving us an exposure prediction. Okay, and those each of those little ticks there stand for one third of a stop. The bigger tick is one stop. So something you're going to notice is that when the tick mark is at zero, it's nice and evenly exposed. There it is, right? If we were to, say for example, open up aperture a little bit, take another picture, it's at one big tick, which is one stop. This should be twice as bright as the previous picture. Take a look. Play. There it is. A little bit brighter. If we were to continue to two, two stops, see how bright that is. Yep. So that little bar is going to be your friend when you are shooting in manual mode. It's going to tell you how bright or how dark the image is. It's basically a light meter. So we've talked about each of the modes. We've talked about changing the exposure controls in each of them, as well as ISO. Let's talk about our white balance. Very important because what's going to happen is you're going to be shooting and let's say you'll take a picture of a friend and the picture is going to look like a, a little yellow or a little bit bluish. If you're a pure beginner, my recommendation is to shoot with auto white balance. But you're going to notice that when you come into this menu is that we have these icons of different light sources. And the short answer on this is that our eyes are very good at adjusting to different light source temperatures. I'll talk about the theory in just a second. The short answer is, is that your images are going to look better. They're going to look more accurate color wise when your white balance is set correctly. So auto white balance means that we're going to give permission to the camera to change accordingly. But 
We have these other ones, incandescent light. So that's a tungsten light bulb. We have fluorescent light. See how blue it became? We have fluorescent light, direct sunlight, flash. We have cloud cover, shade, and then we have something called preset manual. Go through each of these all together. So the short answer is, if you see something funky, change it to the icon of the light source that you are currently shooting in. Okay, that's the short answer. The long answer in the discussion that I get into that upsets a lot of people talks specifically about the color of these lights. And we don't, again, we don't notice it, but these different light sources have color wavelengths attached to them. And the way these colors are measured is something called the Kelvin scale. And it ranges anywhere from 1,000 Kelvin to 10,000 Kelvin. And Kelvin is an actual temperature. So the lower temperature is 1,000 or 2,000 Kelvin. Those are very yellow or orange appearing light. Think of a candle. And the higher temperature ones, like nine or 10,000 are very blue. Think of a blue blowtorch. That's what I like to tell people because it's obviously hotter than a candle. So the low end is yellow, the high end is blue. The way the camera works is the camera does the opposite in order to compensate for that. So if you're shooting in a very, let's say, yellow lighting condition and you come to your incandescent setting, it's going to add a lot of blue. And that's why this is blue right now. Um, it's, it's adding all this extra blue and it appears blue. It's not that that light is blue and people get the scale mixed up, okay? It's that the camera is going to compensate with the opposite of whatever light you're shooting in. So if you're shooting in a very blue light and you take a picture, you know, you'll pull that picture into Photoshop and you'll add yellow on your white balance slider to correct it, especially if you're shooting in with raw files. Now the confusion comes in is when people start referring to the colors as warm or cool because Kelvin is an actual temperature and the hotter you get, the more blue it is. But if I were to take a picture of this, it would be completely appropriate. Okay, so that's even. We come in and we select incandescent. What happens is among photographers is people would say, that is a very cool looking image. So when the image has a blue appearance, sometimes we refer to it as cool. If it has a yellow hue to it, sometimes we refer to that as hot. But that is the opposite of what the Kelvin settings are for that light temperature. So that's where it's confusing is just to be a little distinct in terms of what you're talking about. Okay, so the appearance can be referred to as hot and cool, and the light temperature itself can also be referred to as hot and cool. Okay, and those are two different things. That's where people get upset with me. So if you wanna talk about the theory of how white balance is measured, it's, it's a theoretical black body that scientists use, and they heat it up to these Kelvin temperatures, and they measure the amount of color coming off of this black body. And that is how uh, color temperatures are calibrated. It's a very cool thing, I think. Something else I wanna point out is that if you come into the white balance menu is, you'll notice that we have this little triangle here pointing to the right. That is going to allow us to access many different types of fluorescent light. And we can tweak it further by pushing to the right and we get the color temperature shift. So we have red, blue, green, magenta. That's what those letters stand for. And so if you're in a shooting situation where it's just a little off and you want to tweak it, this is where you could come in and do it. I typically don't mess with that a whole lot, but this is where it's done. In the case of the D3500, what we need to use in mixed lighting conditions is the preset manual. What this does, it, it allows us to take a picture of something and tell the camera that this is white. See, it's not letting us do it from here. We can use a photo, but we just took a picture. We're gonna say, we're gonna select this image. And so now we're on preset manual. If, if you hadn't taken a picture, you would take a picture of this. There it is, that's white. Those are white blinds. And then you would come in and you would use that picture, or you can select other images. Come in here, here they all are. This is just this one I just took. Yeah, that image. 
And so now the white balance is set correctly. So that is an overview of setting your white balance. The easiest way to learn your camera's focusing systems is to think of it in terms of how, when, and where the camera is focusing. If you can break it down into those three simple concepts, this is going to be easy. Now when you get your camera out of the box, the default setting for focusing, once it's turned on, is that when you push the shutter button halfway down, it engages the camera's focusing systems. So that's how you focus. If you push it down all the way, it's going to take the picture. I'll do it real quick. Pretty straightforward. When the camera is focusing has to do with how often the camera's focusing systems are engaged. Is it a single moment or is it over and over and over again? The way we access our autofocus modes, which has to do with when, is we're going to push our I button and you're going to see it in the bottom left hand corner. When you come into this menu, you should see four different options and the truth of the matter is there's really only two. AFS stands for autofocus single servo. And what this means is that when we push the shutter button halfway down and hold it down, eventually we get something called focus lock. And if you look in the bottom left hand corner of your camera, when this is engaged, you should see a little green circle. That means the camera has focusing lock. Now, as long as I hold the shutter button halfway down and I move the camera around, the focus will not change. This is a very important and powerful tool if you are interested in taking pictures of people. Because as a portrait photographer, we want to get focus lock on their eyes. And so what I do is I get a focus lock, hold the shutter button halfway down, and I recompose. That means I move the camera to position the subject in a more aesthetically pleasing position in the frame. If you're a sports photographer or maybe you shoot wildlife or race cars or kids moving around, you're probably going to want to test out AFC, which stands for autofocus continuous. So when we select AFC, you should be doing following along with your camera if you're not, and we look through the viewfinder, you're going to notice something very interesting when you move the camera around that green dot starts to blink. And what this means is the camera is continually focusing over and over and over again. We do not achieve focus lock with AF continuous because the camera is trying to make a prediction of a moving subject. What we're going to do is put our, our focusing square over the moving subject and we're going to hold our shutter button halfway down, track the subject, and push the shutter button down all the way when we're ready to take the picture. Very useful for moving subjects. Now the good news is, if, if you are a pure beginner, what I recommend is to go with AFA, which stands for Autofocus Automatic. In this mode, we're giving the camera permission to switch between AFS and AFC. When I shot weddings, I almost exclusively left my camera on AFA because the bride would be standing outside the church. Now she's walking down the aisle. Now she's standing at the altar and now she's dancing and now she's cutting cake. And so there was lots of this uh, moving and stopping and moving and stopping. And the camera does a pretty good job of determining whether or not you're dealing with a still or a moving subject. It's one less setting you have to worry about. Now the fourth option we have in this menu is M. This stands for manual. The truth of the matter is I never use it simply because our cameras, most of the lenses come with an AF to manual switch. So when I want to do manual focusing, I flip the switch to manual and I focus with the ring. But there are some lenses out there that don't have this switch. And if you have one, you would manually focus by going into your menu and turning it to M. So the when the camera is focusing has to do with the autofocus modes and whether it's a single focus lock or a continual refocusing. Where has to do with our focusing points. The way we select this menu, again, we're going to push our I button. We're going to go into the second from the bottom left-hand menu. 
it says AF area mode, and you're going to see four different selections in here. I'm going to make a very strong recommendation to use your single point selection in nothing else. The reason is the other three modes give permission to the camera to change how the focusing and which focusing squares are being used. With single point selection, you have complete control and you know where the camera is looking and where it's focusing. And what does this mean? You should have your camera, look through the viewfinder and tap your shutter button and you should see one of those focusing squares light up. Now, wherever the camera is lighting up in terms of those points, that is where it is focusing. If you want to change your focusing square, you are going to push on your directional pad in the direction that you want the next square to be selected. So we push on the pad and we can change our focusing points. This is very useful and it's one of the more important skills you need to, to become, you know, like secondhand nature is changing your squares as you look through the viewfinder. So for example, if you wanted to get a moving subject on the edge of the frame, you would use one of the edge focusing points. Again, pretty straightforward. Now, a cool little tip about this is that if you push the OK button, it'll jump back to the center square. A lot of people don't know that the center square is hypersensitive on almost all DSLR cameras, and that's the same for our Nikon, is that it is more sensitive and more accurate. So if you're having a very hard time, you know, getting a precise focus lock, keep that in mind. The center focus square is cross type, the other 10 are, are not. Very important to remember. For the sake of being thorough, let's talk about the other autofocus area modes or the other wares. The dynamic AF focusing cluster has to do with allowing the camera to get information from the surrounding squares. It sort of like takes a little sneak peek and it makes a judgment on where the subject's going to be. 3D focusing is meant for moving subjects and it's supposed to allow the camera to actually change which focus square is being used and how it is focusing on the subject. It, the, the concept of it is spectacular and when it works, it's awesome, but it's not always perfect. The AF, or the autofocus automatic mode, essentially gives permission to the camera to focus on the closest subject to you. I never use it. And as another side note, I should tell you that if you are not shooting on PAS or M, which you should be, the camera is going to make a lot of the focusing decisions for you and you're not going to be able to switch around in these different modes. I tell all beginners, focus, no pun intended, on the PAS and M modes, the creative modes where you have complete control. Now, as you advance as a photographer with your skill sets, there may come a time when you want to use different customized controls such as back button focusing. Back button focusing essentially is a customization that removes the halfway shutter depression of focusing and it moves it to this back thumb button, AFL, AEL. So the way this would work is you engage focusing by pushing on the thumb button and you take the picture by pushing the shutter button down all the way. The shutter button is responsible for nothing else but taking the picture. Now the reason I don't teach back button focusing to pure beginners is it's simply a little bit easier to learn the halfway depression and then taking it all the way. But a lot of my professional friends shoot exclusively on back button focus and when you get more advanced, I would definitely recommend checking it out. So in summary, how does the camera focus? You push a shutter button halfway down. Second, when does the camera focus? That depends if you are on a single mode or a continuous predictive mode. Single mode gets focus locked. The continuous predictive mode tries to guesstimate where your subject is going to be. For focusing clusters, I definitely recommend you go with the single square simply because it's going to give you the most control. Let's talk about focusing in live view, meaning using the back monitor instead of looking through the viewfinder. Focusing through the viewfinder is far better in terms of the speed, performance, the accuracy. If you're shooting sports, definitely shoot through the viewfinder. However, there are times that you want to see what you're doing for video shooting, for example, uh, definitely using the back monitor, obviously. And there are other times as well. And there are some tricks and some tips I can show you using 
the live view monitor. So we have this red box, that's our focusing square in live view. And again, the how we focus is we push a shutter button halfway down, we get a beep that tells us that we're in focus lock, green square, push down all the way to take the picture. That's the same as it would be through the viewfinder. The different part here is that this box can move to a greater area of the viewfinder. And so I have a little target here that I've moved to the front here. So we can focus on that, shutter button halfway down. There it goes. You can see that my picture is a little blurry, handsome model back there. And so that is the basic way of, of how we do is we're moving the square to different parts of the viewfinder and we're, we're engaging the focusing systems. If we look into the I button, there's our focusing mode, auto focus S, single, one time focus, right? Come in here, we have auto focus full time, which is the live view version of auto focus continuous. So what this means is that if you have, if you're in auto focus F, camera's going to be continually, it's a servo focus. And then we have manual focus, which is exactly what it sounds like. You're dialing it in manually. So if we select AFF, what's going to happen is that you're gonna see this little breathing every once in a while. There it goes. See there? Boop, 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 boop. It's improved dramatically over the years on Nikon cameras. However, if you are shooting video, this is something I'm gonna to try to tell you to not use in video. Some cameras can pull it off, but the breathing of this shifting can be very distracting. If you're shooting video, come to manual focus. And there's a number of, of little tricks and ways to get around this. For example, if, if you were worried about not getting it just right, you could come into autofocus single, get the focus lock, and then hit your video record button. Remember, autofocus single is only engaged when you push the shutter button down halfway, right? So this is locked. It's not going to change. Very important tip for shooting video. It's going to be much faster this way. How do we change the size of the box and the type of the box? Right here, area mode, which is the cluster. And there's only four of them in here. We have wide area. And we have a normal area, which is a smaller box. See how small it is? Again, we would have to push and hold to, to move this guy around. It feels a little tedious sometimes. But if you're shooting people, we have this thing right here, face priority. Face priority scans the, the preview, finds a person's face, push halfway down to get your focus lock, all the way to take the picture. When you're shooting at apertures around 3.5, 4.0 in smaller apertures. It's probably gonna be the fastest way to get focus lock on a person's face. If you're shooting at very wide apertures, let's say you have a 1.8 50 millimeter lens, it may not get tack sharp focus simply because the depth of field is very shallow. So keep that in mind. But for most general types of shooting, yeah, face detection for people is awesome. And there is an additional mode in here as well called subject tracking. Also improved over the years, it's, it's gotten better. So on the tracking mode, you're going to notice that we have this new dialog box that says OK. When you push it in yellow, that means it's supposed to be tracking. Push it in again and it's white and it resets. The idea of tracking mode is that the camera will automatically follow a subject that you say, hey, follow this thing over here. All right, so put it on my face, hit okay. It's gonna turn yellow. Yellow is a warning, so let's move the, move the camera around. And it does a pretty good job tracking on a clean background, okay? The problem is it's not focusing. Remember, we're in autofocus single mode, so we would have to push the shutter button down halfway. And now it's saying, yeah, this looks like it's in focus, we get the green box. So in a perfect world, we would have it on AFF, and as we move it around, the camera is re-engaging focus even as the subject changes. The problem with this is, is that when I test this outside, there's so much focus breathing, and, and when you get into a contrasty background, it doesn't work the way 
you want it to. Okay, so you, you might have some frustrations, but if you have a if you have like a, a really clean background and they're not moving around too fast, you can make it work. Okay, I just don't personally use it myself. So those are the focusing modes in Live View. Those are also the focusing clusters. For video shooting, again, I recommend autofocus single, single square. I think that is going to be the easiest. We can just tell the camera, hey, focus here, move it over, focus here, hit the record button, and that way you don't have the focusing changing. Real quick, I also wanted to point out that the focusing square can be reset to center by pressing the OK button, which is something I thought you guys would want to know. Let's talk about back button focusing, which is removing focusing, engaging from the half shutter button depression to a back button, such as the auto focus lock button. The reason why we want to do this is, especially as sports shooters, there are times that you want to specifically control when the camera is focusing, and by lifting your thumb up, you're essentially jumping into manual focus. So it stops focusing. Very useful when players are stopping and you want to recompose quickly. So if you have to get a shot of somebody who's just stopped for a second or two and you want to recompose it, you would engage the focusing systems, get the lock, lift it up, you could recompose, take the picture, and, and your focusing wouldn't change. There's some other reasons to do it too. Coming into the menu, we have on the orange tab, buttons, third page. So the important thing here is that when we are shooting with the shutter button, we have it's, it's basically saying, do you want it to focus, yes or no? If this is on, halfway shutter button depression is going to focus. If it's disabled, it will not. So we come back out, I'm pushing the shutter button halfway down, it's not focusing. If you forget to do that, <laughs> sometimes it's really scary. Now we're going to come back to assigning this button. I'm going to turn it to auto focus on. We have some other options in here, but this is really the one you want. So now I am engaging focus with the auto focus lock button, and I can shoot away whenever I want to take a picture. That is how you set up back button focusing. If you want to switch it back, you could leave that on, or you can go with auto exposure lock. Just come back in here. Turn that to enable. This middle item essentially is asking, do you want the exposure to lock as well with a halfway shutter button depression? Default is to have it turned off. Let's talk about a technique that I refer to as manual zoom focusing. Very powerful, very easy to overlook. This is something that I talk about in a lot of my advanced courses on other cameras is these kinds of techniques. We have a manual focusing ring on the front of our lens, even the 18 to 55. Almost all lenses have annual focusing rings. And if we turn our auto focusing off, if we come in here and turn this off, we can now focus with this ring. Because we have a live view monitor and we have these magnifying glasses, we can really take this a step further. It's gonna be great for things like macro or very shallow depths of field, maybe video work where you have to dial in a very precise focus you're going to push the magnification icon. What's going to happen is the camera is going to zoom over the area you have selected. Once you're zoomed in, now you can start dialing in focus and get that precise, crisp, sharp image that you want. Something like this. I'm looking at the edges of my target. At this point, you can zoom back out or you can even shoot from that position, take the shot, that is a very good technique to have in your quiver. It's going to come in very handy for all kinds of manual focusing problems. Let's talk about our camera's metering modes. Bottom left hand corner, we have our metering mode indicator or the matrix metering mode. The short answer on this is this is how the camera measures light. Okay, we're, we're telling it what area to look at to measure the amount of light coming in the camera. You'll notice that we have this headlight on. And as I move around, it changes a little bit, nothing too dramatic or crazy, right? It's because we're on the matrix metering mode, which, which is sampling from the entire frame. It also measures things such as color and things of that nature. But if we were to come in to our metering modes here, you're going to see that we have three options. We have our matrix metering mode, which is a general purpose metering, good for most uses. 
center weighted metering, and then we have our spot metering mode. So the easiest way for me to explain this is to talk about it in the spot metering mode. When we are in the spot metering mode, and in this case, the focusing square, we're telling the camera to look within this box to measure light specifically within this box. And I'll, I'll demonstrate how this works. See, when we move it over the bright light, remember aperture priority mode makes adjustments to the shutter speed based on the light entering the camera. One four hundredth of a second. It's much brighter here, right? So when we move it off to the side, it's using a longer shutter speed because this is where we're measuring light from. If we were to take a picture here, and look at it. And then we were to come over here and take a picture. Again, we're on aperture priority mode. It used a different shutter speed. So when we're playing these back, there is a change in the exposure because the camera measured light in two different places here versus here. So that is what the metering modes do. And I'm going to turn the light off and, and do an extreme example here in a second. Uh, the metering modes are helping the camera determine how much light's coming in. Center weighted metering mode, it essentially gives emphasis to the middle of the frame more than the corners. I, when I'm using anything, it's either matrix or spot, and the time that you, you might want to think about using spot is that if you're shooting a portrait, for example, with somebody backlit, so they're standing here and you have bright sun coming around them, we want to ignore the bright light and we want the metering to happen on the person. That's a great time to use the spot metering mode. So let me turn the light off real quick. We're right over the light. Let's take a picture. Why not? And now I'm going to move my square over the blinds. We get a much more dramatic shift. But again, we're in aperture priority mode. So it's trying to make it work. See how much brighter that light is between here to here, and that's how metering modes are working. So one question I get a lot uh, on these entry-level cameras is how do I do focusing for video if I can't use autofocus full-time or face tracking? What do you recommend for shooting myself if I was you know, doing a vlog? The trick is that you set up a tripod or have another person sit in your place. Tripod, I use tripods all the time. And, and essentially, you're going to focus on the area where your face is going to be. Engage the focusing system. So, you know, we're in live use AFS. Focusing won't change at that point. So once you get that, you would come in and you would move the tripod out of the way. And then you would come and sit in that place. That's how you set up focusing for vlogging. And then when you're ready to record, you would hit the record button. Definitely helps to have a slightly higher aperture, f4, f5, to get the depth of field that you need. You might be moving around in here, and so you want to keep the focal plane, you know, where, where you're going to be talking. A couple other quick notes on video shooting, just real quick. If you are shooting at 30 frames per second, let's just go ahead and do this. Let's just go to video mode. Shoot it on manual. If you're shooting 30 frames per second, you're going to want your shutter speed to be twice your frames per second. So in this case, it would be 60. See how bright the exposure control is over here? We would want to turn down our ISO, it's too bright. So I'm just showing you basically how I would set it up. Turn my ISO down. Uh, aperture size, uh, F5, F6, 3, 7.1. See how dark it's gotten? We'd have to come back in and bump up our ISO. So close we are. And so that is how I would set up for video recording. Start recording. It may be a little bit overexposed and we could adjust our ISO or adjust the aperture a little bit. So let's talk about our movie settings real quick. We're going to be going through the menu briefly here in a second, but this is pretty important is, is that if you come in here and you select this, you get all these different options frame size and frame rate, the movie quality, the microphone, wind noise reduction, manual movie settings. So what we just did there in the menu, this manual movie settings, uh, it's very important because it is going to give us an exposure 
preview of what we're shooting in. It's telling us how bright or how dark it is. We're, even though we're in the manual mode, now we can see that this is kind of blown out. And this is good because it is telling us exactly the exposure that we're shooting in. So this is more of an even exposure, right? The problem with this is, watch what happens. I can change my shutter speed still, right? And it's saying, hey, you want to maintain 60 frames per second. You can't use a longer shutter speed than 1 60th of a second. That's what that means. Oh, and hey, I'm using LED lights. You can barely see it. You can see these gradients coming in. If you see that, that's a missync between your camera and your LED lights. There, it goes away. The problem with this is, when you're shooting in this mode, is that you cannot change your aperture. Okay, it's a bummer. So, I don't really shoot with that on this camera. I kind of keep an eye on my exposure preview. You can always record, take a look at it when it's done on playback, just to make sure everything's fine. You're okay to play it. I'm talking, it's funny. So we have these, these different playback controls here. You can pause it. So we have this directional pad. There's rewind, there's forward, there's stop, there's play. This is talking about this dial. We can jump 10 seconds in either direction using the rear control wheel. Press the I button. And we can even edit the movie. I don't do it in camera. There, It's there if you want it. But this is how you play video back. So if you're doing something important, make sure you preview your work for doing everything just to make sure everything's all dialed in. Let's take a look at these other movie settings in here real quick. The most important one is the frame size and frame rate. So when we come in here, we see all these confusing numbers. These numbers here in the middle, 1920 by 1080, those are the most important ones that you should see. Those are pixel dimensions. 1920 pixels wide by 1080 pixels tall. The number on the very, very end is the number of frames per second. So shooting at 1080, 60p is actually a very high quality video uh, in terms of the rate and the resolution. It's not 4K, but the truth of the matter is 1080 is plenty. You could, you could shoot a movie on 1080, okay, and, and publish it no problem, especially on the internet, okay? You can get away with that. Frame rate means that it's going to be sampling at 30 frames a second. P is a progressive scan. It means every line of the frame is going to be scanned. In the past, there was something called interlaced where the, where the images was, were interlocking together. and We just don't use that that much anymore. Uh, but if you look over here on the far left, all this is summarized in these little icons. And as we move down, we get 50p, we get 30p, 25p, which is PAL, the PAL standard in parts of Europe. 24p, which is the standard for film. And we've got 720 if we continue to go down. And so those are the movie settings. I'm usually almost always shooting at 30p or 60p for YouTube. Uh, it just depends on what your preference is. The 60p looks a little bit crisper. Some of these other settings in here, the movie quality, if you want a higher quality, you could turn this on. The microphone, we have a microphone built into the camera. The automatic setting means that the camera is going to make adjustments to the sensitivity depending on how much how much noise coming in. And so this red thing here, we this is bad. Okay, that means the audio signal is being clip, clipped out. I'm not a fan of auto sensitivity. I typically use manual sensitivity. In a perfect world, this would have a microphone jack and we would plug an external microphone into it to record high quality audio. In the case of the D3500, unfortunately, we do not. If you are doing serious video work, I would recommend something like an H4N Zoom, an external recorder or a shotgun microphone or a lav microphone that you can record to a digital audio recorder like the H4N. The H4N is a workhorse. It's been around for years. I still use mine. I mean, I've had it for over over 10 years, easy. Maybe, yeah, maybe even longer than that, it seems like. Uh, so if, if you're going to do high-end quality video, keep in mind the importance of good audio. and You'll have to record it to a separate audio source. If you wanted to turn off the microphone altogether, you could do that here. But I like manual sensitivity 
because it allows us to adjust the gain of the signal coming in. And anything red is bad, so we would we want to stay kind of in that yellow zone without that's good. That's something that I would adjust to. And so we can actually control the gain of the microphone. I'd hit OK. Wind noise reduction essentially is supposed to help clean up the sound of wind. It doesn't really work. And then we got again our manual movie settings, which I don't recommend using because then you're going to lose your aperture control. So those are your movie settings. So let me take you through an overview of the deep menu system. We talked a little bit about navigation. Again, yellow is where you are. There are these different tabs that you can scroll through. Then we want to go to a specific item, push to the left or right. To select, press OK. So the delete icon essentially allows us to delete selected images. We can select by date. Anytime you see a black triangle on a menu item, that means if you continue to press to the right, you're going to get more items. So the idea here is that you can select different images and selectively delete them. I typically do not do that unless I'm running out of space on my memory card. Get the best memory card you can. You don't need, really need to have a super high-end performance one, but you know if you're going to Walmart and, and buying anything less than a class 10 card, uh, probably gonna run into some problems with your video recording. I like the U3 cards because you can upgrade when you get a 4K camera. They're not that expensive. So typically I, I recommend get the best card you can afford in terms of speed and size coming back out. We also have the ability to delete by a date. Pushing to the right, we can pick, it is the 3rd of October back out. You can also delete everything. I don't recommend doing that. I, I recommend formatting the card and that's later on in the menu. When we play our images back, do you want to play back from all the folders or just one? So there's the ability to have multiple folders. Select all. Playback display options. This is pretty cool is that when you play the image back, do you want additional information such as an RGB histogram? Overview, let's just hit OK. We're gonna play. And if we push up, we're given access to the histogram, our shooting information. This is super helpful, I think. You'll notice that it also recorded the focal length. So you know the exact focal length that you were shooting on. The date, the time, all good, good stuff there. Image review simply means that after you take a picture, do you want the camera to automatically show what you just took? Auto image rotation essentially means is that when you shoot in the portrait or in, so we're in landscape now, if we were to rotate the camera and shoot in portrait, if you have these two turned on, the camera is automatically going to rotate the image during playback so it's standing tall. Uh, you won't see that immediately after the camera takes the picture, but when you play it back, you should. Slideshow. Remember, we have an HDMI port on the side of the camera, so we could plug this into a TV. We, we did this back in the day when I shot weddings. Is we would shoot ceremony and then at the reception, we would play back some of the images on a TV. And so, yeah, you can connect an HDMI cable from the camera into a monitor or TV. Essentially, this allows you to determine whether or not you want stills in video clips. How long do you want the frames to show for? Maybe five seconds. And then when you're ready to start, you would hit OK and it would start uh, animating the playback for a slideshow. Rating allows us to assign a star to each of the images that we take. So pushing up or down on the directional pad, you can say, hey, this is five, this is a five star image, it's amazing. And then when we import it into Lightroom or Photoshop, that rating would be respected. And so if, if you are out shooting and you take an amazing picture and you're so excited, but you have thousands of them, you might want to come in and mark which one it is. It'll help you find it easier when you are going through everything. See that how I, I was on a tab and I, I tried to go down a page. So we've got to make sure we're here. We're going to talk about this when we talk about Wi-Fi. Essentially, it allows you to send images to your smartphone. Very nice. Something you'll notice missing are video clips. Can't do the video clips. We'll talk about the Wi-Fi app set up in just a minute as we get through this. Green tab, this is your shooting tab. 
you're going to be changing a lot of the settings in here. And sometimes you're going to change something and you may not know exactly what you did and something's acting weird. You can come in here and reshoot the setting menu. Image quality. This is the amount of compression for JPEGs. It also allows us to select raw or raw in JPEG. Raw files have a lot more information in them. It's essentially the raw data captured by the sensor. Larger file sizes, definitely, but it's going to allow you to edit them, correct white balance more accurately. You're going to get greater dynamic range, better colors in raw files. JPEGs can be as small as 20% of the raw file and less if you're choosing more compression. So quality not as great, but for most general shooting purposes, if you're, if you're nailing the exposure and it's not like a paid shoot, a lot of JPEGs are going to be just fine. I know a lot of sports shooters, a lot of wedding photographers, they shoot exclusively on JPEG, many of them. Image size has to do with the pixel dimensions of the image. 24 megapixels is large. 6 megapixels is small. So basically the camera would be throwing pixels away. I recommend staying on large. Why? Because you can downsize if you need to. ISO sensitivity settings, this allows us to change. Here's our basic ISO, just like we can do from the camera. Auto ISO sensitivity control, which again, I'm not a huge fan of that. Once you turn it off, you're going to notice that you lose your maximum sensitivity and your minimum shutter speed. So when this is on, you can designate the top ISO that you want. So you want to keep it under 6400. And you can also designate at what shutter speed do you not want it to go slower than. That's the easiest way to say that. If you're shooting sports, it may be 1 500th of a second. If you're shooting people, it may be 1 60th or 1 125th of a second. Again, I'm not a huge fan of auto ISO, and I leave that turned off. White balance settings. This is where we can come in and select our white balance. We can also tweak some of the shift. We can designate our preset manual. Picture controls. There's a lot of information in here. The short answer is these are the recipes for cooking JPEGs. They can be cooked in different ways. Vivid, you're going to have more pop in your blues and greens. Portraits, you might have better flesh tones, landscape. Flat profile, which is something that is different between the D3500 and D3400. A lot of uh, video shooters prefer the flat profile for grading purposes. On these cameras, the short answer, I say try to get it right in camera. If you want to adjust the picture controls, you can come in here. Look at all the different ways we can tweak, tweak these ingredients. We can change the sharpening, how sharp the images are, the clarity, the contrast, the brightness, the hue, the saturation. So we can come down here and adjust this up or down. My recommendation is if you are brand new to photography, do not worry about these profiles. Do not mess with these too much. If you do a lot of high-end shooting, you might have a reason to, to make some adjustments. But for the most part, no, nope, don't mess with it. So you got some auto settings for saturation. Really great. Come in here and change whatever you want, pretty much. Color space, the short answer is sRGB. If you're shooting for a magazine and you have a specific reason to choose Adobe RGB, you would do that. Active D lighting is an automatic change and adjustment to some of the contrast, a little bit of the dynamic range you might see in images. For JPEGs, yeah, it makes sense. If if you want to see what it does without it, turn it off. Take some side-by-sides. Noise reduction. I typically leave this on. It means the camera is going to clean up high ISO noise. Vignetting control is that when you're using very wide-angle lenses, this is going to clean up some of the corners in terms of the darkening. Auto distortion control is also for wide angle lenses most of the time where you get a bowing or a bending when you're using very, very wide uh, focal length lenses. So 18 millimeters, 15 millimeters. Sometimes you get this bowing. The focusing modes we've talked about in the focusing lessons, here they are. Auto servo, single, auto focus continuous in manual. I think it's easier to select them on the back of the camera. We have our focusing clusters. So our autofocus area mode allows us to designate what focusing cluster we're using for the viewfinder. 
single point, dynamic, 3D, all 11 points, auto. We can also determine that for live view. They're all in there. Built-in auto focus assist illuminator. This is the little lamp in the front of the camera, and it won't kick in unless it's kind of dark. But if you wanted to turn it off altogether, sometimes that happens. You're, you're at an event, and sometimes it's dark, and it can be super distracting. You come in here and turn that off. The metering modes we've talked about. There they are. Flash control for built-in flash. And I'll break this down for you as fast as I can right here. TTL stands for through the lens metering. When you have this selected for your flash, two flashes are fired. The first is a pre-flash that measures the amount of light that bounces off your subject and comes back in through the lens. That's what TTL stands for. This allows the camera to make a super fast calculation and fire the main flash for the exposure. This all happens so fast we can't see it. Click, it looks like one single flash. It's pretty incredible. Very powerful for general types of shooting. If you're out and about and you're taking a picture of your loved one with backlight through the lens metering, you know, hopefully it's gonna do the job for you. But Manual control is exactly what it sounds like, is that you are going to control how much power the flash is putting out. Manual control means that you select a fraction of the power from full power to 132 power. So you're, it's not metering, it's not measuring anything. So let me activate the flash and show you something super confusing. Flash is up, you can't see it, just know that it's popped up. We're gonna take a picture here, all right? So that all happened really quick. There's our image, and there are a couple cool controls we can do. Now, if we push the flash button in, we can change the flash mode. Typically, the main flash happens at the beginning of the exposure. That's the default. If we push this in, we get the yellow highlight. This flash with the eye means that it's red eye reduction. That means we get an additional flash. It's going to help dilate the pupils before the main flash exposure fires. And then we have something called rear curtain flash, which is really great for longer exposures. So if you're doing a slow exposure and you're really soaking the sensor and, and maybe you have a person moving in it, this is going to give you a ghosting effect. It's a creative thing you can do. Essentially, we're, we're telling the camera to fire the flash at the end of the exposure. So I, I leave it on default like this. So typically the question is, is how do you change flash power when you're shooting in this way? You're going to push two buttons down, this main button, and then the exposure compensation button. Now we have something on the bottom here called flash exposure compensation. It's very similar in how, how the information is displayed in terms of stops. So if we add one stop of flash power, the flash is going to be twice as bright as it was before. And we can go in the opposite direction as well. It's easier to go to you know less powerful flash than it is to increase so we're, we're limited to one full stop of flash power which is twice the brightness or we could go into the to the menu and dial in the manual powers here so that's a quick overview on the flash optical vibration reduction most of the kits that you buy the d3500 with are going to come with a kit lens that is a vibration reduction lens if you wanted to turn it off, you would come in here, select off. Movie settings we've talked about. This allows us to designate our resolution, our frames per second, the quality, some microphone settings, the movie settings if you want an exposure prediction. Lots of great stuff in the orange tab here. Let's come up. So if you set a bunch of these settings in here and you forget what you've done, you can reset it. Formatting a memory card. This is a really, really good one to have on your custom tab. If you come in here, it's gonna ask you if you wanted to wipe the memory card clean, you would select yes, and it would format the memory card. It would erase everything, including protected images. Anytime you put a new memory card in here, probably something you're gonna to wanna to do is to reformat it. Just make sure you have two copies of every image somewhere on different hard drives or in different places, maybe one on the cloud, one on a hard drive. Date stamp. Do you want the date stamped on the image? You can basically try that out if you want. It has a date warning on there. There it is in the bottom 
left hand corner. Turn that off. Don't like it. Time zone in date. This is where you could when you when you turn the camera first on, it asks you, you know, what time zone are you in? What time do you want? If you wanted to change it, you could do that in the Hawaii time zone. You could it's pretty straightforward, pretty intuitive. If you wanted to change the format, daylight savings time, we don't have it here in Hawaii. Language, hopefully you are an English speaker if you're watching this, but we have Spanish, French, and Portuguese. Monitor brightness, we can control this menu item by pushing up and down. Info display format allows us to select different layouts of our LCD info screen. Whether it's for auto, scenes, or effects, but this is really the one you look at. And you can actually see the differences in colors. Some of these are kind of cool. Blue, black and white, different versions, very nice. Auto info display is something I do recommend you leave on. It essentially means is that when you push a shutter button halfway down, do you get this information on the back of your monitor? If you didn't want that appearing, you would come in and turn this to off. Auto off timers. I have it set to custom now because I'm teaching, but if I didn't want the camera shutting off every minute, this is where I could come in and adjust it. Typically the camera, you know, as a battery saving feature, maybe every 20 seconds, every minute, just depends on your preference. We also have playback menus. After how many minutes do you want this to turn off? Let's just go to 20 seconds, image review, live view, things of that nature, all timer, battery saving stuff. Self timer allows us to determine how many seconds our timer works on our drive modes. Okay, lock up mirror for cleaning allows us to tell the, the mirror inside the camera to flip up and give us access to the sensor. So if you were gonna clean your sensor, you would hit start, press a shutter button, mirror lifts, lower the mirror, turn the camera off. So at this point, the mirror is raised and you could actually get in there and, and clean your sensor. And then when you're ready to close it, you turn the camera to off again. So the reason I talk about this is some of you are going to be comfortable cleaning your sensor, others are not. I would say read the reviews of any product that you're buying to clean your sensor because some of them are not good. I personally prefer something called Dust Aid. It's a very mild adhesive that cleans off a rubber pad that pulls particles off. I'm not a huge fan of the wet solutions anymore because I've had a, a bad experience. Somebody had a wet solution, they asked me to clean their camera, it wasn't the best, and there was a little bit of residue in there, it just made me nervous. If you're terrified of cleaning your camera, take it to a camera store, most camera stores will do it. I typically clean with dry solutions, you know, an air bulb, um, you know, the, the dust aid solution that I use, and things of that nature. If you're not comfortable with it, have somebody who knows what they're doing, do it. Dust off reference photo, I think is, kind of a waste of time. Basically, it's it's a, a reference photo where you could tell the camera where you have a desk spot and you come in, you pick it, you know, take a picture of something bright, 10 centimeter, and it's gonna find these little specks to designate where to clean up. I think this is a waste of time. I think the way to do it is to keep your sensor clean. You can, you know, you can clean up dust in Photoshop if you had to. Image comment means that we can Put a comment into the metadata. This is where we could type it in, obviously. Good. Same thing with copyright information. If you wanted to put your copyright information in here, do that as well. Beep for focusing, things of that nature, selecting things. This is where we would turn it off. Flicker reduction has to do with the camera deciding in measuring how to reduce changing lighting conditions that we cannot see with the naked eye. Most lights are not constant. Okay, a lot of modern lights are not constant is that they are pulsating so quickly that we can't tell the difference. Camera has the ability to recognize this and the auto setting means we're giving permission to the camera to figure this out and to minimize the effects of this flickering light. If you go and you do a lot of high-speed photography under certain sodium lamp, lamps, you'll see it. 
fluorescent lights, LED lights. There's these variations that happen, and you can see it sometimes as banding or color shifts. Short answer for stills, auto is great. If you're shooting video and you see heavy banding in your video, it looks like these little black lines coming up and down. On your video settings, what I'd recommend is shooting with a shutter speed of about 1 60th of a second to see if that reduces it. Sometimes 1 50th of a second, it depends on the frequency of the lights that, that are in the shooting environment. Uh, biggest common mistake is, is like fast shutter speeds and there's a mismatch of the frequency and you'll see that banding. But 1 60th of a second seems to resolve a lot of it. But in some cases you might have to use a different light source, you know, if you're doing serious shooting. Just a side note for you all. Button customization we talked about with back button focusing. This is how you can assign this button to be autofocus on and remove autofocus activation from the shutter button. The rangefinder is a tool that is used for manual focus. I am not a huge fan of it. The rangefinder will show these little tick marks and I think to the left is in the front and to the right is to the back. And, and as you rotate the manual focus ring, it'll help you dial in what is in focus. Manual focus ring in auto focus mode means that you can use auto focus and then find tweak with the manual focusing ring. If you want to turn that off, you do so there. File number sequence. When you change your memory cards, do you want it to remember the next number or do you want it to reset or do you want to reset it right now? But basically when you're changing your memory cards, do you want the number to continue on the next card? Storage folder allows us to designate a folder by number so we can create new folders by coming in here and, and pushing up, for example, pressing OK. And now we're in storage, storage folder 103. We can also come back and select from a list. So if you have a shoot in the morning and a shoot in the afternoon, you might want to create a secondary folder just like I showed you. Change the number. Or you can bounce around between those folders and how you save it. The file naming. Individual, individual file naming, those three letter designation, DSC, you can change that here. HDMI information, the output is typically auto, but if you know that you want to feed the HDMI cable out at 1080p, you can do that here. Airplane mode allows us to turn the camera into a safe mode and never use it. Connect to a smart device we'll be talking about in the Wi-Fi lesson, Talk all that stuff. Slot empty release lock. If you do not have a memory card in the camera, do you want the camera to be able to take a picture? So if it's locked, nothing's gonna happen. If you enable release, it will open the shutter and close it, but nothing's going to be recorded. There was a, a couple, a couple a couple years ago emailed me and they're like, hey, you know, we went on vacation and we could hear the camera working, but you know, how do you get to the internal memory? And I'm like, there's no internal memory on the camera. They had they had enabled the shutter without a memory card and didn't take any pictures on their vacation. We can reset all the camera settings if we wanted to. Firmware version. This is how we can change the software of the camera. This is telling us the current versions that we have. So this is the first camera software that came with the camera. And if something happened, there was a bug, Nikon can issue an update and they say, hey, we got update 1.01. And you would know that you, it was time to update. I believe these other two have to do with the lens in terms of the lens performance or and or some of the cleanup for things like distortion and vignetting and things of that nature. Hit done. So let's go to the purple tab, the retouch menu. I have mixed feelings about it for the most part. I never use it. It's essentially going to give you some editing options in camera if you don't have a computer or Photoshop. If you've taken some raw images, you can process them. Again, here are the blinds and we can come in and change some things like white balance, the exposure compensation, noise reduction, color space, vignetting control. So just some basic light changes. We can trim the image. So if you wanted to, let's say, crop it down or change the aspect ratio, we can do that. Rotating this wheel, we can push on our, our thumb wheels in and out, back. We can resize the image. Typically this is, means downsizing. Pick the one you want, and then you would pick the new size. There's, there's not a lot of reasons to do this in camera. 
you want, I mean, you want to do it on a monitor where you can see everything. But we have things like delighting control, quick retouch, eye correction. We can straighten the image, distortion control, perspective control, fish eye control, filter effects, black and white. Image overlay it would allow you to choose multiple images and stack them on top of each other. Color outline, photo illustration. Some of these are, are cool to play with, you know, but I, I just don't personally see them as serious editing tools. And then we have the ability to edit a movie if you wanted to trim it down in camera. Again, all these things I do on a computer, it makes more sense to see it on a big monitor as you're doing it. So this final tab, recent settings, essentially the camera remembers the last settings that you, you found in the menu. So the idea is that if you're using the same menu items over and over again, is that you're going to see most of them on this first page instead of needing to come in here and hunt, you know, for something specific. So that is an overview of the deep menu system of the Nikon D3500. Let's talk about our camera's drive modes, which is what the camera does after we push the shutter button down all the way. To access our drive modes, we're going to push right here. Drive mode button It's going to pull up the options we have. First, we have single frame. Push the shutter button down once, takes one image. Then we have a continuous drive, which is better for sport shooting. Listen. Five frames per second. If we come over to the quiet shutter release, listen if it's quiet. A little bit more. And then we have our self timer. We can designate how many seconds. This beep, obviously that's annoying. And if we, if we wanted to adjust that, we could come up here, self timer, and we could change that from two to five to 20 seconds. So those are the drive modes, single frame, multiple frame, quiet, self timer. So let's talk about connecting remotely from our smartphone or device to the camera. Very important that I make the distinction that this is through Bluetooth, not through Wi-Fi. Our camera does not have Wi-Fi. It's gonna prevent some confusion because the app is going to show some Wi-Fi options. This is for other cameras. So SnapBridge, download it from the Apple App Store or the Google Play Store. Open it up, it's asking to connect to a camera. We're gonna come into our menu and we have our Bluetooth on. And we're gonna go connect to smart device. Once that starts up, we're going to hit connect to camera. Wow, look how fast I found it. In the past, okay, I understand this, starting to connect. Snapbridge hasn't always been very good. In fact, when the D500 came out, it was terrible. It was unusable. I couldn't, I couldn't make the lesson. So it see, it recognizes the Bluetooth signal coming from the camera. We're gonna hit pair. And when we hit pair, it wants us to hit OK over here to connect. So it's going through this, it's, it's pairing up. Wi-Fi connection is usually better. It's a better signal. You can do some things through Bluetooth, such as remote shooting. I'm talking about a remote control, not necessarily changing our exposure settings or getting a preview. We can download some of the images. It's pretty limited. It's asking if I want to download location data. This is that GPS setting. So if you want to download the info, we can if we hit yes. Do you want to sync the clock? Yeah, sure, why not? But remember, all this is, is happening and, and the upload is happening through Bluetooth. So we're gonna hit okay. Here's our camera. Here's the remote photography. Don't get too excited about this because on other cameras we can change our white balance, we can see the, the preview, we can do all kinds of stuff and you're gonna be a little underwhelmed. So here it is. That's it, that's the remote shutter. It's taking a big uh, picture, it's automatically downloading a two megabyte file to our, our phone. So there it is, there are the blinds. And that's how the remote works. There's some information that we can take a look at, see how big the file is, but at least we get a preview to the phone if you wanted to post it onto social media or something of that nature. Two megabytes, number of shots remaining, battery life. Here are the settings. You can download two megapixels, um, automatic download or not. You're going to notice that the original size is grayed out. We have the ability to add a self timer. So if we wanted to add a timer, three, five or 10 seconds, there it is. 
we have an auto link feature that will help us pair up when we open the app. You can sync, location, clocks, power saving mode, download images if you want to get into the camera, and download them individually. So the good news is, is that, that the app is working. The bad news is no, it's not Wi-Fi. And what you can do in here is very limited. There's a cloud service if you guys are interested in that. Unlimited auto upload. And this is where things can start getting confusing, is that you can add a camera. You know, I have a D850, other Nikon cameras that come out. You can add them here, and you'll be given some options in terms of the DSLRs. They have the new mirrorless cameras ready to go in here. I like this because it doesn't require us to download multiple apps, and we can, we can have all of our cameras in here. Some other things I just want to point out is that we can forget camera telling it to forget the pairing authentication. If you do this, just make sure you delete the Bluetooth profile in your camera settings. Otherwise, you will not be able to reconnect. In this part here, the Wi-Fi mode is confusing. It's highlighted. There's no Wi-Fi mode on the D3500, as far as I know, without a Wi-Fi feature on the camera. So that's a quick overview of connecting with SnapBridge. So you're probably wondering, what are the next lenses you should get after the kit lens? The 18 to 55 is really not a bad starter lens. The problem with it is the aperture doesn't open that much. You can see it's very small. There is also a 70 to 300 kit lens that you can get. And those, for the most part, are great when you're shooting outdoors, okay? If you want to get a wider aperture lens, I personally like the Nikon 50mm 1.8. The problem with it is it's over $200. There is a knockoff brand of that lens called Yunguno. I have not personally used it, but the reviews are pretty good and the price is incredible. It's, it's also a 1.8, it's gonna open up to be a wide aperture. On the high end, we have the trinity of Nikon lenses, the 14 to 24, 2.8, the 24 to 70, 2.8, the 70 to 200, 2.8. All very expensive, and, and if you go that route, you're probably looking at upgrading your camera body. Make a huge difference, and that's what I'd recommend is if, if you get serious about those lenses and, and camera bodies, you're gonna be investing more money. Probably what I would advise if, is if you're under a budget is take a look at a good tripod. Bogan Manfrotto has the Be Free tripod. It's a little compact travel tripod. I think that's a better investment than something you'd pick up at Walmart. I know Walmart has these, you know, really rinky dinky tripods that can be anywhere from 40 to 50 bucks. Things complete waste of money. Granted, it's better than nothing, but you're going to beat those up pretty quick. Invest a little bit more money into your tripod with a locking ball head. It's going to last you for years. I think if you're on a budget and you're looking for a great way to get into macro photography is to invest in a set of extension tubes. I'll put that link in the description. Extension tubes essentially allow us to move our lens away from our camera body and increase the ratio in terms of the projection onto the sensor, makes them larger and essentially allows you to get close up. And there's also some budget flashes that I would recommend. In any event, I wanna say thank you guys so much for joining me on this tutorial of the Nikon D3500. If you're struggling with the concepts of photography, check out Universal Photography Concepts it's the best course that I could put together for anyone in the world struggling to learn photography. Very fast, very efficient. That link's in the description as well. Keep in mind, I also have a contest going on right now for a brand new A7 III. That link is in the description as well. Thank you guys so much for watching, and I will see you next time. If you found this video helpful, you might be interested in one of my many camera or photography specialty courses. They're available by DVD and download and come with a 100% money back guarantee. They can be ordered from the following link.